it's finally here everyone my deep dive video about desperate housewives which i've been working on for months basically over the whole summer and i'm so excited that now i can cover this show in full today we have a little guest star diego the bearded dragon he's <laughs> happy to see you guys i've been watching the show over the summer and reacting to it every time i watched a season i would put a video up in my youtube channel about the season and share with you guys what i thought and recap what happened there's definitely some stuff i said in those videos that i don't resonate with as much much now because I've seen the show in its entirety but today we're breaking down the worst written characters in the show in my opinion the best parts of the show the characters I love the evolution of the show overall it still has such an influence even today and at the time it was like one of the most watched shows and it had a lot of concepts in it that hadn't been done before like this idea of focusing on suburban mums who actually have very interesting messy lives and the simplicity of motherhood Hood, but then combined with this murder plot every season or mystery or crime. I was a bit harsh on the show in my last few videos because I said that I was really sick of the girls behaving in dumb, stupid ways. Now that I've looked at the show as a whole, I am starting to get the point of it more, which is that it's literally called Desperate Housewives. Desperate. It's about the women being desperate and doing dumb things because they're looking for escapism or they're not satisfied with their lives and so as a result I do believe that Desperate Housewives knows what it is. I 100% would recommend it if you're looking for something new to watch and I'm so glad that you guys were begging me for ages to watch it because this kind of show is right up my alley. It's exactly the sort of thing I would watch but it's set on Wisteria Lane in this fictional state in the fictional town of Fairview. There is a detached narration throughout the show of their dead neighbour Mary Alice who watches over her neighbours from beyond the grave and talks about what they're getting up to. The storyline covers about 15 years of the women's lives over eight seasons. It's definitely a show that could have been better if they cut it down a bit because as it dragged on they were clearly running out of ideas at a few points and so that's why I found that season seven and eight were my least favorites not because they were bad they were still good season three was the best in my opinion followed by maybe season five and season one which were all my favorites but season five onwards definitely lacked the satire and the dark comedy of the earlier seasons and characters like Orson and Catherine started behaving in really dumb bad ways that weren't true to what we knew about them. I liked season seven a lot but was a bit weak in terms of the whole mystery subplot of Paul Young coming back to town and him feuding with Felicia because we'd already seen that dynamic play out and we knew they were enemies so there wasn't really much to be intrigued by like we know he doesn't like Felicia she doesn't like him Paul Young's revenge plan was also really pathetic he's annoyed that the town turned their backs on him when he was in jail and so he tries to start this riot and ruin the neighborhood vibe and I was like what are you doing dude like it was just genuinely lame Paul Young has always been a very dry character with this whole sob story of everyone hates me which got really old and season seven just had some illogical stuff in it as a result that I didn't love such as him being so sure that Susan was trying to poison him and working against him and I don't know why he would accuse Susan when he obviously should have been accusing Felicia when he knows how much that she despises him and how much he can't trust her that she's tried to in the past fake her death to frame him for it and get him in prison but no apparently it's Susan's fault and the fact that the police were so accusatory towards Susan saying were you poisoning Paul and she was like no I didn't do it Felicia was with me Felicia poisoned the food which was true and they still weren't believing her is so dumb. Felicia has a criminal record, really? And for a lot of season seven, everyone is just so blissfully ignorant about Felicia's dangerous side, which is so dumb because she's obviously dangerous and yet she starts to befriend Susan and Susan's totally unaware that Felicia can't be trusted and even Paul was allowing himself at points to be alone with Felicia by a lake with no one around and then being actually shocked when she pulled a gun on him and I was like 
really. There were still plot holes and stupid stuff happening in the earlier seasons, but it definitely was happening more towards the end of the show. Such as towards the end of season seven, Gabby's stepfather, who had abused her as a teenager, had come back and was following her around, like literally stalking her. And rather than her telling her husband or the police, she goes to practice using a gun to defend herself. Rather than letting people know what was going on, she was just suffering in silence. And in season eight, Carlos had accidentally killed Gabby's stepdad when he broke into the house to attack her and Carlos hit him over the back of the head trying to defend his wife. And for some reason, when all the girls rush in and see what happened, they don't call the police, they choose to cover up the death, which was just a dumb decision. I understand that Carlos has a criminal record and that Gabby's stepdad was unarmed, so it looks bad, but the dude had still broken into their home. That was a crime in itself. And he'd abused Gabby as a teenager. So like Carlos was trying to protect her. I just struggle to believe that they would really go to the lengths they did to cover it up. Then the girls are all being questioned about the dude's disappearance. And they're all for some reason agreeing that it's Bree's fault, their friend, and ganging up on her and being absolutely horrible to her, especially Gabby. I couldn't stand the way Gabby was acting towards Bree. And then when Bree starts getting these threatening letters about the cover up, and she's like, why am I being like threatened? The girls are like, well, Bree, this must be your fault somehow because you're the only one getting the letters and you must have done something wrong behind the scenes and you're not telling us. And so Bree starts getting really depressed. She tries to end her own life and she's struggling. And then she's hooking up with random men every night as a way of, I guess, trying to fill the void. And rather than the girls being concerned for her, they're like, oh my God, is that another guy? What's she doing? I just hated that, especially considering the girl's friendship for the most part has been built in a foundation of trust and care throughout the show. They would take a lot of risks for each other. It's not nice for in the final season all of that to come crumbling down and for them to not be respecting their friend. Then in season eight, I don't know what was going on. Maybe they were running out of ideas or trying to jump the shark or shock us one last time because they're bored, but they chose to kill off Mike, who's a major character in the show, the main love interest of Susan, has always been just a stand-up guy. And out of all the husbands or guys they could have killed in the show, I don't know why they chose Mike, because it was dumb, it wasn't needed, and it was just a genuinely hurtful and wasteful use of his character. It was very upsetting and like not in a good way. He and Susan had been through so much. Him getting amnesia, two weddings, separation, third parties, financial problems, a car crash, so much that pulled them apart back and forth, which did get very repetitive and annoying by the way. But I was happy that at least they were stable by the end of the show. You don't then go and kill him off because it makes me feel like all that time we spent investing in their relationship was ultimately a waste anyway, and I just didn't like that. That scared me so bad. It was genuinely terrifying, I forgot he was there. But yeah, I'm all for drama and tragedy, but only if it serves a purpose, and doing it in the last few episodes of the show was genuinely dumb. And no one even tried to avenge his death or find the killer. I thought maybe the finale would be focused on getting justice for Mike's death or something, but everyone seems to move on and bounce back pretty quickly, including Susan. They're all managing to hold it together somewhat. And so much of the finale is focused on Renee and Ben's wedding, to seriously unimportant characters. I didn't want the finale to be about their wedding and for it to be set on their wedding day. Like, I don't care. They're both quite nice. They're fine characters, but they're not deserving of that much attention and stuff. I think I would have felt very differently if Renee was introduced earlier in the show, but since she was only introduced quite recently, I just really didn't see her as like one of the main housewives. Same with Angie, who was introduced in season six, right? She was only there for a season. She disappeared again. As much as I liked her, she just didn't feel that important to me because she wasn't there for very long. One other issue I had with the show, but this was a problem basically throughout, but especially in the later seasons, is how hard they try to find 
exciting things to talk about, but then they're too ambitious for their own good. Like every episode, there's a stabbing, a plane crash, a mental breakdown, someone tries to kill themselves, and it's just very intense, one thing after the other. And they're just going too fast with the pace of the show. And then they introduce this really good concept, and then they forget about it. There's no closure, and they drop it. Like Lynette and Tom had this daughter introduced to the family called Kayla, who was causing real problems for them and she was very badly behaved. But then when that was beginning to be resolved, they drop her and she's never mentioned again. And I don't like that because I'm like, okay, what was the point of all that if you're not going to resolve it properly? Same with the Fairview Strangler. What happened with him? What was the point of that? I really like the show, by the way. As much as I enjoy it, I'm happy to acknowledge that it does have problems. And there were definitely some problematic parts of the show that didn't age so well. And some sensitive topics, I think maybe they were too scared to explore properly or the network didn't want to talk about them. Abortion, it was another very sensitive topic apparently because they don't even use the word. They just go, oh, I guess I have to have the baby. By the way, I'm not saying that it's wrong for the girls to want to follow through with a pregnancy season have the baby like that's absolutely fine they can do what they want I'm just saying that it's interesting that there were so many pregnancies in this show where they were like I'm pregnant I guess that was the network not being comfortable with showing that on TV or discussing it but it's funny that a topic like abortion was so hushed over and so uncomfortable to discuss but then topics like grooming or murder are fine and they're thrown around all the time and discussed all the time or like supermarket shootings everyone's cool with that but then when it came to abortion they were like oh my god don't talk about it Gabby grooming John was definitely totally hushed over as well like they just forgot about that she was not held accountable I don't know what was going on. She's a major character and for a major character to be a predator is a pretty major screw up. There were other things too but I already talked about them in my previous reviews of the show and recaps of the show so I'm not going to go over every little thing. I'm definitely sure that now some of the stuff in Desperate Housewives you wouldn't really be able to get away with now because people would react differently. I want to get into discussing each of the main women and their roles in the show and what I thought of them, my favorite housewife, etc. So we're going to start off with Susan, I think. While developing the series, the Desperate Housewives creator Mark Cherry envisioned Susan as like a girl next door. Cherry said, I knew Susan was going to be my anchor character. I thought there was something so real about a woman saying, I don't have much time left. And then when this available hunky guy moves onto the street, something in her is saying, let me at him. And a lot of her storylines revolve around her love life, which got kind of annoying after a while, to be honest. She marries Mike Delfino twice in the series and she has a major crush on him immediately when he moves onto the street. And and that definitely made me like Susan so much in the first season. But as the series progressed, Susan was definitely received less favorably by critics and she was seen as annoying and I felt the same way. I don't really have an issue with her being selfish so much because people criticize her a lot for being selfish, but I know loads of other characters in the show that are selfish like Tom and Lynette and Brie. And so to me, Susan's selfishness doesn't stand out more so than the other girls, but it's more like her childish behavior. You keep forgetting that she's a grown woman because of this attitude she has and this baby voice she does that gets quite annoying and also her being like a drama queen and making a big deal out of stuff that isn't a big deal. There are lots of things I like about Susan though and I do think that overall the fandom can be pretty harsh on her. I think she's hilarious. Definitely some of the funniest moments in the show are related to Susan. I like that Susan is this hopeless romantic and that she's so vulnerable with expressing her feelings but I struggle to believe that in season eight after Mike dies that she would even remotely totally function without him. Like I genuinely think if he died, she would just die of heartbreak, you know, <laughs> because she's had this pattern of being so codependent in her relationships. Susan did have some really sweet moments, like when she was visiting Mike every day for six months while he was in a coma and holding out hope that things would be okay. It was really sweet. And the Paul Young thing in season seven was absolutely the nicest thing. He had treated her so badly, he'd antagonized her, he'd almost stopped her from getting the kidney transplant she needed. So awful. He was the reason she was trampled in a riot. He tried to out her for something she was doing behind Mike's back to get money. And yet in season seven, she chose to see the humanity in him. They started to form this friendship 
it and then genuinely like cared about each other it was so sweet she was cooking for him and when his wife died she was like you know what guys he's all alone no one cares about him so i'm going to be the person that visits him like so cute and i also believe that her relationship with mike made her a way more likable character simply because they're such a good couple and they have so much chemistry and i basically shipped them from the moment they met like i love them together and this show is so crazy it's nice for once to have a stable consistent character and even when susan was being so irrational or annoying or making bad decisions he was always so gentle with her that definitely meant that a lot of her scenes were better because he was in them overall people are too too harsh on Susan. She's not half as horrible as Gabby. Like, do you guys remember some of the shit Gabby's gotten up to? Like fighting two men in wheelchairs and stuff? No matter what way you look at it, I don't see how people can criticize Susan and then not criticize Gabby. And people are very vocal about their dislike for Susan, but I don't see people being as vocal about their dislike for Gabby or as vocal about their dislike for Mike. I mean, Mike is a great guy and everything. I think he's amazing. He's pretty boring. Like not to sound mean, but he doesn't doesn't do much throughout the show. There's not much to him. I do have issues with Susan though, big ones. So I understand why some people wouldn't like her and I'm not saying you should like her because I get why you wouldn't. She does a lot of really bad selfish things throughout the show but it's never criticized appropriately and she keeps getting second chances or people try and like justify her decisions and be like, oh, she meant well. She has a lot of love in her heart. She's not that bad. And so she often never actually needs to take responsibility for her actions or even worse she plays dumb and she's like oh I'm sorry I didn't know that would upset you I really did want to help her awkward charm and clumsiness and quirkiness her accident proneness and proneness to bad luck was definitely the writer's way of trying a bit too hard to make her relatable but I was like okay this is getting a little bit clownish now this is not very realistic I'm okay with them making her the silly one in the group and maybe a bit of a bimbo compared to the other girls but there's a poor point where they're just making her a child and almost infantilize infantil infantilizing her i'm not saying that right but that was the vibe i got also susan has a close relationship with her daughter julie but julie was often acting as the parent figure in their relationship and doing things that no child should have to think about doing when susan was devastated over her divorce from Carl, Julie was the one like pulling her out of bed and no child should have that burden placed on their shoulders. And so when Julie got older, she started getting in relationships with older men. And it makes sense because she's been treated like an adult her whole life. Of course, she wouldn't resonate with a 20 year old college boy who sits around all day playing video games. Like obviously she'd want a more like mature older guy but yet Susan was always shocked about this like oh my god he's too old for you and I felt like that was really lacking in self-awareness and in season eight it was really sad because Julie and Susan were getting into this fight and Julie finally shared her memories of her childhood and I realized that Susan's neglect was a lot deeper and more serious than Susan had let on or that I'd realized it was she was even being forced to come with Susan to spy on Susan's ex-husband and no child should be put in that position a hundred percent Susan was trying to avoid responsibility as a parent by saying, oh, but look how well you turned out, Julie. I guess I did a good job, but Julie turning out well was 100% due to her own maturity and hard work. It didn't have anything to do with Susan's parenting because Susan's parenting was terrible. And it annoyed me that Julie ended up then apologizing to Susan and being like, I'm sorry, you know, you really were a great mom. You did your best. No, she didn't. Susan didn't do her best and she wasn't a great mom, like no. And then Mike came to Julie and was like, Julie, you said some pretty horrible things to Susan. Like what she does comes from a place of love. As far as flaws go, you've had it pretty good. And I was like, shut up, Mike, stop defending Susan. Like Julie's anger is completely understandable. And I've just got a list of a few of the dumb or nasty things that Susan did throughout the show. And this isn't even like the tip of the iceberg. This is just some of the most memorable things for me. So I'll just list them off for you so you get an idea. But in season one, Susan broke into Edie's house, this woman she doesn't like, because she thought that Edie and Mike were hooking up. And I guess she was trying to spy on them, which was really dumb when you keep in mind that she had no ownership over Mike because they weren't even in a relationship. And then she ended up accidentally setting Edie's house on fire, knowing Edie could have been in there. And and not like doing anything about it to make sure Edie would be okay. In season three, she was dating Ian, but had feelings for Mike. And it was this love triangle situation where she 100% was kind of messing around both of them and couldn't really make a concrete decision. 
And in season six, her daughter Julie is attacked and she put full blame on Angie's son, even though he had an alibi and there was no proof. And she tried to kill him with his car, like genuinely murder him. Then she got every person in the neighborhood to basically bully his family and she was shouting, he strangled my daughter, again with no proof. And then she was accusing Catherine of being the killer and just being so irrational about it. And then when she ended up realizing that she was wrong about Angie's son, rather than coming to Angie to like, apologize, she saw that Angie's yard had been littered because of Susan, because everyone then hated her family. And Susan just bent down and started helping her clean up and pick up the trash without actually saying anything. And if she thinks that's a sufficient apology, no, it's not. Then there was this whole love triangle situation in season five. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. Basically, she was dating this guy called Jackson, messing him around, being selfish and acting like she had ownership of him even though she'd rejected him. And then she found out that Mike and Catherine were dating and she said it was okay and gave Catherine permission to do it, but then was annoyed and not wanting Catherine to look after her son, MJ, even though Catherine was being a good guardian simply because she didn't want Catherine to be spending time with her son and then she got annoyed that Mike had bought Catherine these pearls and tried to break into Catherine's house and then she stole the pearls because she was annoyed about how Mike was spending his money and trying to dictate to him how he should spend his finances and then annoyed at him for not working hard enough even though she does fuck all and never works and was acting as if oh god it was just the whole thing was a mess. Then in season six Mike ends up dumping Catherine for Susan and Susan is so inconsiderate about how that would affect Catherine and yes Catherine was a total bitch, Catherine was going crazy, but Susan really was acting like she was the wronged party and I think she could have had a bit more sympathy for the fact that Catherine had been like publicly humiliated and dumped. I talked about it so much in my season six video, I'm not going to go into too much depth, but I went off about it in detail for good reason, you know? But then in season eight, Susan started to have this emotional affair with Carlos because he understood this guilt that they both shared, which is not an excuse by the way to be like, making your husband get worried about the state of your marriage. After they all covered up the death of Gabby's stepfather, Susan was feeling super guilty about it, which is understandable, but she was happy to literally drag all the girls down with her. And then she was like, I need to tell Mike about what we did. And the girls were like, well, you can, but you're gonna actually make the situation worse. And the more people that know, the higher chance the police will find out, so maybe don't. And Susan's like, no, I need to tell Mike. And then she feels so guilty, she flies to go and see the family of the dead guy to try and comfort them or something and she behaved super suspiciously and ended up leaving her card with her name and address on it and then basically told the daughter of the guy don't worry he's never gonna come back oh my god she was basically throwing all the girls under the bus because of her guilt and then she made this painting in her art class I'm showing a group of women standing around this dead body and burying it you're so stupid and then when the police find it they're obviously going to be like that's dodgy what's wrong with her the painting like Bree said was effectively a confession in itself did she want to get caught and go to prison seriously Mike was like justifying and playing into it because she was saying I'm feeling so guilty Mike was like of course you are Susan it's a sign you're a good person I was like no it's not it's a sign she's a bloody idiot and then in season eight probably the worst thing she did was she was lying and coercing pressurizing and guilt tripping Julie her daughter into keeping her baby Julie had gotten pregnant and she did not feel ready or financially able to be a parent and Susan was like oh my god no you can't what about me I want to have a relationship with my grandchild me 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 it was Julie's call it was Julie's decision to make and if she's treated Julie like an adult her whole life then allow Julie to be an adult in this situation too and make the right decision rather than like smothering her and making her feel bad about it. And she kept saying, I know what's best for you. Like, no, you don't. I was gonna have a whole section of Mike as well, but I realized looking over my notes that I don't have that much to say about the guy, which basically summarizes Mike. He's almost too much of a realistic character to the point that he's actually a bit boring. And I love Mike, but they could have done more with him. And I also really don't like his whole hero complex in season eight around feeling the need to jump in and making enemies with this lone shark, which ended up killing him. He was putting himself in so many dangerous situations. And after getting married and having a kid, he really should have thought twice before trying to play the hero all the time. Like he did it a bit earlier, but I thought it was kind of cute. But after a while, his whole reputation of being the tough guy on the lane was actually getting really 
annoying how ready he was to get in a fight, punch someone, or call someone a son of a bitch. He is a great husband to Susan. He's so caring, he's loving, but them killing him off like that was absolutely unnecessary. But now I've talked about that, I want to discuss Lynette. And this is going to be long. I talked about Susan for ages, but boy, do I have a lot of stuff to say about Lynette and her husband, Tom. A summary of Lynette as Mary Alice's narration notes is that Lynette used to see herself as a career woman and a hugely successful one at that. Lynette then gave up her career to assume a new label, the incredibly satisfying role of full-time mother. She's the smartest out of all the women, she's very direct and assertive and telling people what to do because she's genuinely meant to be a businesswoman. But she's had kids and although she loves them, there's definitely a bit of resentfulness there because she kind of wants to have it all but doesn't have time or the energy to do that. And it makes her a very sympathetic character. And I'm sure there are so many women out there that can relate to Lynette. And so I do like her. Her storylines involve her relationship with her husband, Tom, and their domestic squabbles and arguments. And boy, those two argue way too much. Like they are the worst couple in the show. Early storylines often revolved around Tom's position at an advertising firm, which caused him to frequently travel. And it put a strain on him and Lynette's relationship. And then he became a stay at home dad for a bit. And he basically demanded that she went back to work, but he wasn't very good at that either. And then he ended up opening this pizzeria, much to Lynette's dismay. And eventually, because she pushed him to, he ended up getting this really big successful job and then acting like it was his idea. But she was the one that told him to do it in the first place. And there were a lot of opportunities he had. I can think of at least two where he had a really big job interview he could do, but then he was whinging and saying he didn't want to do it and completely blew the chance. My favorite storyline between them was 100% when they divorced and then in season eight they're separated and trying to navigate those feelings because I'd never seen them like properly separated before on the show and it was super juicy to see them operating separately as characters. I'm really hoping that after that wake up call of almost divorcing that their relationship will be happier going into the future but I'm not convinced especially because in the finale after just getting back together Tom was already making this passive aggressive comment about how nothing will ever Ever make Lynette happy. They have like five kids together. After the time jump they had to change the actors for the kids which was so jarring because I was like who's that? And there's this one kid. I don't know what the point of his character is after the time jump but every time I see him on screen I keep forgetting that he's related to them and my brother watching it thought that he was just a family friend or something because he never does or says anything. Like what is he doing there? Who is he? Like he has no personality. Lynette is a really loved character like Susan. There's a lot of people out there that just genuinely dislike her and think she's the worst housewife. I personally don't at all, but I get why people wouldn't like her because of her control freak personality and also her extreme hypocrisy. Like in season three, when she's always been going on and on and on about how Tom might cheat and how she doesn't want him to have an affair, but then she literally starts having an affair like an emotional affair with this guy that comes to work with them. But when I first started the show, I loved Lynette because she was just so sympathetic, like trying to juggle all these kids and then she got cancer and I felt bad for her. But the reason I like her more than Susan is because they actually acknowledged that Lynette has a problem with being controlling. And a huge part of season eight is Lynette realizing how controlling she'd been in the past. And at one point she goes on this date with a new guy and then she realizes that she's got this massive problem of trying to tell him how he should live his life and getting out this flow chart being like hey let's do a five-year plan and even her twin son started saying mom we want to do our own washing and be independent but you keep doing everything for us and mothering us so how are we ever going to learn to do that so as a result because of this introspection that Lynette started to get I did like her more than Susan Susan's like selfishness and childishness wasn't really justifiable it was just a bit pathetic whereas Lynette being controlling I kind of understood because if she didn't nothing would get done like she had five kids to look after and her husband was effectively a child himself and if she didn't call the shots I can guarantee the house would have burned to the ground by now but still it is worth acknowledging her control issues so I will talk a bit about them she also spoke to Tom's boss and had him removed from a promotion because she didn't want him to be far away from the family which really annoyed me because it happened all the time where she'd say you need to provide you need to do well for this family but then when she
when he actually got a high flying position, she was then annoyed that he wasn't spending enough time with her. So she was like never satisfied. She also always thought she knew what was best for Tom with his job or how he should run his office or how he should run his pizzeria or what kind of outfits the employees had to wear. Like she was always inserting her own opinion and was never okay with him just making a suggestion and her listening. Then Tom tried to go back to college to learn Chinese and she totally sabotaged his exam day. Then in season seven, she completely manipulated Tom into accepting a job he didn't want and I understood why she did that because he should have taken it it was a good job but then she actually got annoyed when he was successful and she was like oh come on you don't need to lie to me we all know Tom's terrible and incompetent so she had no belief in him and wasn't proud and she was so not okay with him trying to then provide for her and take care of her with this new money he had he was trying to pay for the family vacation and she was like no I want to run the family vacation and they were just arguing so much it was exhausting to the point that their daughter Penny heard them arguing and started crying on the staircase and I thought you know what Penny I don't blame you for crying your parents are losers both of them she needed to come along to this conference as a plus one and as a wife and she was so annoyed like I want to be the big boss. I don't just want to be the wife. I'm a businesswoman too. I was like, shut up. Up, oh, Lynette. My biggest issue with Tom earlier on in their relationship was that he was always jealous of Lynette's success and he'd start like sabotaging when she got a good job interview or something. But then I realized Lynette is no better. Like she was equally triggered by Tom's success. They just can't be happy for each other. And the thing is, Lynette totally has no trust in Tom's decision making. She's constantly doubting his judgment. He's a moron. I wouldn't trust his judgment either on anything. But the problem is, if you're so like disappointed in him, all the time and you truly have no faith in him, then my question for you is, why are you still together? In one scene, Tom says that he allows Lynette to have power and boss him around because she had an alcoholic mother, so she needs power and control to feel safe. No, stop making excuses for people. It's lame. That's not a justification. Sure, it maybe gives me an insight into why, but it doesn't justify the behavior. I don't care what her reasoning is. If her actions are having a bad effect on him, then that's a problem. Also at their vacation retreat, Tom took her old shitty engagement ring and he added diamonds to it to try and upgrade it. And instead of thanking him and being happy, Lynette said she liked how it was before. And then Tom said, well, before you would make fun of the ring in front of our friends and families for it being crappy. Which highlights to me that Lynette really never is satisfied. Like she's very negative. I don't hate her. She's a great friend 90% of the time. I love that she speaks her mind. I love how brave she was when she went through cancer. Her worst qualities come out when she's with Tom. And I think she's so much of a better character, independent, separately from Tom. Something else that bothers me too is when Lynette's old friend Renee comes back onto the lane in season seven to live with her for a bit. She's realized that she's in love with Tom because they had this brief affair like 20 years ago and she's like, oh my gosh, I have feelings for him and I think he might be the love of my life and she cries to Susan about it. It was a pretty big deal and she was even kind of trying to seduce Tom which was really bad. Like he turned up to her house and she was in a towel and she was flirting with him and the whole thing was so gross. I thought it was going to cause a major rift. Like I thought maybe Tom was going to leave Lynette to be with Renee. But then the writers did the weirdest thing where they seemed to change their mind and backtrack and they made it sound like just a meaningless affair from 25 years ago that Renee is over now. And when Renee came to take responsibility for what she did and confess it to Lynette, she said, Tom and I hooked up years ago. That wasn't being fully honest though. Like if she was being honest, she'd say, I'm still in love with him. That situation was meant to be a reference to something Tom mentioned to his dad in season one about doing something bad and making a mistake in the past. So I'm glad they explained what it was that he'd done, but I didn't love this subplot. And I'm surprised that Lynette managed to bounce back so quickly and forgive Renee somewhat, to be honest, because for me, that would kind of be a deal breaker. I don't think I'd really want to be their friend or hang out with them anymore. Now we've discussed Lynette, I want to talk about Tom because as much as I love this show, Tom is 100% like the worst written character in the entire thing. He is insufferable like genuinely such a man baby such a child everyone acts as if he's this good guy and we all root for him but literally no one does and he's never properly punished for his actions there are other bad guys on the show that actually 
are punished. And then with Tom, he always seems to get like a free pass. I hated in the time when Tom and Lynette were separated in season eight, how the whole thing is around Lynette reflecting, thinking about what she did wrong in the relationship, trying to grow, trying to win Tom back, doing her hair to try and seduce him, putting on a cute dress. He does precisely nothing. He doesn't reflect, he doesn't grow. And I hate how there's this pressure on women in society to be perfect. He always sabotaged opportunities for the family to be financially successful. And then he got annoyed when Lynette wouldn't compliment him and say how good he was at his job. But the truth is at the pizzeria, their format and formula wasn't working. And then Tom got annoyed when Rick, this new guy who worked for them was bringing in customers and money. And Tom was too stubborn to acknowledge that he needed to upgrade what he was doing and revamp the the business. He made Lynette stay home with the kids to be a mom, even though she didn't really want to do that. So obviously that's her putting aside her career for him. And then when he ended up saying, hey, you should go back into the marketplace, Hello, Lizard. I wondered if it's because he was hoping maybe that she'd do a bad job because then Lynette started doing surprisingly well and then Tom was annoyed that she was doing well. Then when their roles are reversed and Tom's working at home for a bit and Lynette's going back into the business world, all Tom has to do is look after the kids and keep the house clean because his standards for cleanliness are different. When she comes back home, the house is always a mess, stuff isn't washed. And so she ends up needing to do the housework and check the kids are looked after properly and go to work. So she's doing double the amount of work. And instead of apologizing, he has this whole excuse around, this is my system, it will get clean. It's just, I'm gonna do it in the evening once it builds up. No. Then Tom got this back injury. I don't know when it was, to be honest, I'm sort of losing track of all the bullshit. Maybe it was like in season two, but he was lying on his back all day and complaining, saying Lynette should give him head because he's bored. But then when Lynette had cancer in season four and she was much more sick than he ever was, he was complaining and saying that she wasn't thinking about his needs enough and checking in on him and making the cancer all about her. There was this incident where the pizzeria was failing and they couldn't afford to keep their employees. So he was making their kids work for them, which by the way, I'm all for kids having jobs, but it just seemed really wrong to be making them work and then getting mad at them when they're not enjoying it or they're getting tired. Like that's just a bit fishy to me. And one of the kids wasn't doing what he wanted and Tom got angry and started shaking the kid and shoving him around. Lynette, rather than looking after her kid, goes after Tom and starts kissing him and stuff, like trying to soothe him. Why are you soothing him? Then in season seven, Tom came home from a long flight. Lynette had obviously been busy and tired out and he went to this whole whingy little hissy fit about the fact that she hadn't left dinner for him. Then in season seven, there's this massive job opportunity. Lynette is like, for God's sake, take it. And Tom has no compassion for maybe why she wants him to, like it's understandable. And he's saying he doesn't want to because of Carlos and he doesn't want to like hurt Carlos's feelings by leaving the workplace to get this better job. And Lynette's like, babes, if you want to be a shark in the business world, that's how it works. And Carlos would do the exact same thing if he was in your position. And Tom's like, no, I don't want to betray my friend. But the dumbest thing is that it's not like he even should be loyal to Carlos because Carlos had not treated Lynette well when she was working at his company and when she was pregnant because he'd wanted to fire her like right off the bat and he was treating her like shit about being pregnant when she was working for him. So I don't know why Tom's being loyal to someone that didn't even treat his wife well when she was working there in the first place. And that's been a big issue throughout the show where Tom's been pathetic and a complete pushover and it comes through in the way he parents his kids where Lynette's always made into the bad cop because she tells them off and disciplines them and then Tom says nothing and sits back like he's the fun dad. So it makes it seem like Lynette's kind of a buzzkill. Also after their separation in season eight, Lynette is being quite mature about the situation. Tom starts dating Jane and although they said they could date some other people, see what's out there, Tom's communication was really lacking. Lynette thought it was a temporary separation but then Tom said it was getting serious serious with Jane. Lynette was like, oh, I was genuinely under the impression we were going to try again. And he was moving way too fast with his relationship with Jane. He'd been dating her for only a few weeks already. He was thinking about committing to her, getting her to meet the kids, going to the kids' birthday parties. And it was honestly super inappropriate. He wasn't even officially divorced yet from Lynette. And I absolutely despise Jane. She was just so annoying. And she said that her last husband had left her for another woman. So I would hope 
hope that she would understand that it doesn't feel very good because Lynette was talking to her and saying, please don't take Tom away from me. And Jane just had no sympathy and she would not step back at all. Another recurring issue is how this show handles consent. And that's been a major issue. There were issues when Edie and Carlos were dating with how she handled trying to pretend that she was pregnant so he'd stay with her or Carlos tampering with Gabby's birth control or Gabby grooming a minor. But I think where the issues with consent came through really strongly was always in Tom's relationship with Lynette. Lynette says she's too tired or she doesn't want to do anything with Tom sometimes and Tom gets so like angry about it. Then he begs and begs until she eventually gives in, which by the way is coercion. She was saying she didn't even remember it anyway, which shows that she wasn't in the right headspace to consent in the first place. And then Tom said, why is it such a big deal? All you have to do is lie there. They did this challenge for like 21 days of sex or something and Tom got so annoyed when Lynette was losing their streak and getting worn out. Then he complained when she wouldn't brag about the size of his area down there to her friends and he was like, you never brag about me or show me off. And then the worst part is it was turned into being Lynette's fault and she was like, I'm sorry I don't brag about you much to my friends, it's just that I don't want to because I feel like I'm not deserving of you and I'm not good enough for you and I'm so lucky you chose me. Like. What? So dumb. And that's another problem I have is that so often, whether it's therapists insinuating it or Lynette herself saying it, anytime there's a fight or a problem in their relationship, it always ends up being made into Lynette's fault rather than both their faults. And it makes me angry. <laughs> so those are my thoughts on Lynette and Tom overall, but I think I'm going to move on now and talk about Gabby. Okay, so I am back. I've had some lunch and I'm ready to keep filming this video. This is the perfect time to have an interval. So guys, go grab yourself a snack, <laughs> go get some water or tea. I will be here, obviously, when you get back. So now I want to talk about the next housewife, which I think is probably the most interesting one to talk about, which is Gabby. I had to put a lot of thought into Gabby. I was trying to rank them for this video and then I kept like scratching it out and then rewriting it and then changing my mind again. So I found it really hard to decide if I even have a least favorite housewife. Like I know Brie is my favorite, but in terms of having a least favorite one, I don't really know. I wasn't even really sure where I stood with Gabby because my feelings towards her are quite complicated. Gabby is hilarious. She is iconic and she's not a bad character by any means. Like she has her fair share of billboard moments that are just so memorable. And I think even though Susan, I found the funniest, Gabby, I always found like the second funniest. She has so many amazing scenes. I loved seeing her relationship with Carlos evolve into something more healthy, but I just don't really know where I stand with Gabby. I thought initially, because she started out as such a shallow character, that she might change a lot by the end and be completely different. And yeah, she did change a lot. Like in season one, I genuinely couldn't stand her and I thought she was so like shallow and annoying. And she definitely became like a better friend as the show went on and more sympathetic. And I started finding her really funny around like season two to season season five, like she just cracked me up every scene she was in and her whole like, I'm better than everyone sassy attitude is very entertaining for sure. Especially because I think a lot of us women have been raised to be quite other centered and stuff. It's surprisingly refreshing to see a female character who knows she's shallow, is okay with being a bitch and isn't trying to make everyone like her all the time. She has no problem with picking fights and she's just completely focused on herself and her own needs. I like her and <laughs> I enjoy her bragging about how hot she thinks she is all the time. It's quite funny. I don't know, I think a lot of people also, because they think she's iconic, forget that she's actually not a very good person and think that she's nice or something. It's really weird because Gabby is not meant to be a nice person. She's meant to be kind of a disaster. She's a former top model turned trophy wife. And when the show starts, she's dating Carlos and he's this big businessman. And so she feels literally desperate to get out and get some attention because he's really neglectful and he tries to buy her love through gifts. But what she actually wants is 
a more genuine romance. So it's super nice that by the end of the show, Carlos is actually showing up for her with affection and treating her much better. When the show starts, Gabby had given up her lavish life in New York to come to the suburbs. And so she doesn't quite know how to fit in with the other women. She's trying bragging about herself and that doesn't really seem to be working or getting her many friends. And because Carlos is never home, she's super bored and described as a drowning woman, which is why there are often scenes in season one of her in the bathtub with John, which to me is almost showing that she's drowning. And so she wants him to be her life raft and save her. By the end of the show, you still sometimes see Gabby and Carlos taking baths together, which is quite nice because it shows that now he's with her and committed to her and she's getting that attention she needs. But I didn't find Gabby a sympathetic character in season one at all. Like with Lynette, I genuinely felt so bad for the woman because she just seemed so overwhelmed with everything and with having like five kids. Gabby had hardly won my sympathy. She was just too vain for me to like her. But I think as the show went on, when I started seeing how funny she was, I I kind of took her as like the comedic relief character. Her and Carlos are always the most relatable, sympathetic characters when they're poor. But the minute that Carlos starts doing well financially in the show, Gabby goes right back to being a bitch again and being really up herself. Like, oh my God, look how rich I am. And I can't get over how bad it was when she was having an affair in season one with John, the underage gardener. Like he was a teenager and she was having a relationship with him. John is literally the worst character in the show. His whole personality is being obsessed with Gabby. And I get he's meant to be the representation of the male pretty boy, but oh my God, it's so boring. No one really seems to care that she was a predator and they get over it pretty quickly. But what's weird is around season five, Lynette's son, who's a teenager, was being groomed by this woman, Anne. And everyone was appalled by it. And Lynette was like, you're crazy. You're disgusting. You're a predator. I'm going to call the police and everyone took it really seriously and that was exactly how they should have handled it when it came to Gabby and John in season one but yet apparently that's different. I'm not saying I don't like her character. I mean, I do. The actress is very talented and very good at playing her but what she did to John the gardener was pretty unforgivable. I don't know why we're meant to think it's okay just because she's the main character. Also, her whole act of I'm so hot, every man wants me, I was a model so I don't need to put the work in, got really old, especially when it's carried through season after season of her thinking she can just cruise through life because she's pretty. I definitely found her a lot more likable when her and Carlos got into a stable place in their relationship by the end of the series because I thought it was so sweet and I loved Carlos's character development. In season five after the time jump, Gabby has kids, which made me kind of uncomfortable how motherhood is forced on her and forced on basically every woman in the show, including Julie in season eight, because Gabby didn't want to be a mother. She was so against having kids and there were multiple times when Carlos was in his villain era when he was trying to coerce and manipulate her into getting pregnant and it really upset her. She has these two kids and then keeps them and she definitely put an effort in and she started spending more time with them and when she found out her daughter Juanita had a crush, she really tried to be nice about it and make Juanita feel good about it, give her advice. So Gabby did her best as a mom and could be very caring. It still annoys me that she didn't just remain childless. I think it would have been nice to have one of the main women in the show remain childless. I remember there was this other woman on the lane, Edie, who had a kid. I was like, wow, is there a single woman in the show who's actually okay with just not being a mum? But anyway, Gabby ends up having kids, which fine, I can forgive it. But there's this ongoing theme throughout a lot of the show about Gabby being concerned with her daughter's weight, especially the older daughter. And there's a lot of fat jokes going around with their weight being played for laughs and for comedic value, being overweight or even gaining a bit of weight is seen as a bad thing. There's a lot of jokes in the show about counting calories and Susan had this imaginary scene where she was like, oh my gosh, what if I got really fat? And she imagined herself like stress eating and gaining weight. And I don't know what the point of that was, that imaginary scene, like it literally did nothing for the plot. It was purely there to make us laugh because she's fat and apparently that's funny. It's very weird. Like the show has a real issue with gaining weight or being seen as overweight. And it's especially interesting when you consider that in the main cast out of the four main women they're all either very skinny or slim so they don't have like plus-sized characters really featured on the show and if they are then they're made fun of that's when you can really see that this show is from like the early 2000s just because I don't know if you'd get away with that now maybe you would 
But it was so odd because Gabby was making out that her daughter's weight was a really big deal and she was going to Carlos about it and Carlos was being useless and not even listening to her concerns. They're not very good at validating each other's feelings and stuff. They still need to work on that. But then there's this scene where Gabby says to her daughter, you're beautiful with or without makeup. Like you don't need makeup. It's like the show started to commit to exploring the theme and then maybe got scared or they didn't know what to do with it. But I could tell that there were still issues there with Gabby, even in like season seven involving not being proud of her daughters and kind of wishing they weren't her daughters. It's not like she fully embraced them and accepted them. Not at all, because when Grace comes into the picture, she's this skinny, sweet, pretty girl and Gabby totally falls in love with her, way more than she did with her actual daughters. She's giving Grace gifts that she doesn't give to her other daughters. She's being kind of snappy at Juanita because she doesn't care about her as much as she cares about Grace. And when Grace is like sent away, Gabby has a full mental breakdown. There were so many moments, especially when Juanita found out Grace's identity, where Juanita was being hurt time and time again because she could see that Gabby preferred Grace to her. Not only did this plot line not make much sense and feel like it hadn't been planned from the beginning particularly, but also it was really upsetting to see Gabby choosing one daughter over her other two, the daughters she actually raised and knew. I expect her to be shallow, I expect her to be vain, but not to a degree where it's actually really hurting people that she cares about. But in season eight, her actions were hurting Brie actively because Gabby was the one that pulled them into covering up this murder and then Brie really spearheaded that by going, yes, everyone, let's cover this up. And Brie was super caring, not wanting Carlos to go to jail. And she was fully happy to do what Gabby felt comfortable with. So Gabby should have been grateful to Brie for like being there for her and Carlos as a friend. But it was so easy for Gabby to turn against Brie for so much of season eight and give her the cold shoulder and just ice her out because she was somehow thinking that Brie was gonna get them caught and blaming her for things that really weren't Brie's fault. And she had no empathy or anxiety over Brie's trial. She wasn't having trouble sleeping as the other women pointed out. And when Carlos is like, maybe I should turn myself in because I don't want Brie going to jail for this. When Brie's literally being accused of killing the dude, Gabby's like, no, no, let's just wait it out, see what happens. And I was thinking, how long are you gonna wait it out for until Brie's in jail and then will you care? I don't see how people can criticize Susan and then not criticize Gabby for having some morality issues. But you know, in this show, none of the women are meant to be the best people, so I'm okay with it. As for Carlos, I really started to warm to his character and I thought it was really well done because when I first started the show, I couldn't stand Carlos and by the end, I felt like he'd grown so much and I actually found him a very likable husband overall. But even after Carlos grew, I still felt like sometimes he would undermine Gabby's parenting or he would always blame her rather than the kids. Even when the kids were being really mean and calling her horrible things, he would make out it was her fault and I was never okay with that. And he was always making out that Gabby's selfish and she is selfish, she knows she's selfish. But there were points where she was being really giving, like when he was blind, she had so much to do and she still tried to hold the family together and there were points when I don't think he really acknowledged that she was trying to help and he was so fixed on being a good person and doing charity work and stuff that sometimes he would be taking a really not very well paid job when he'd been doing well before and then she'd criticize and say I want you to have a better job and he'd be like don't you want me to be a good person and I know Gabby's vain and everything but if she wants her husband to support the family financially I don't think that's too much to ask for I don't think she should be hated for wanting that from him. In that whole Grace situation, Carlos was being selfish and not listening to Gabby's feelings. The therapist gave them some advice, which was terrible by the way, all the therapists in the show are shit, but the therapist said, just forget about Grace, don't mention her again, rip up her photos, so Juanita feels like a priority, which means never acknowledging Grace. And Gabby was like, oh my God, but Grace is my daughter too. And because she could never talk about Grace or think about her or try and find her, she literally started to have a mental breakdown over it and miss her so much. And Carlos had no empathy over it. He was being so mean and like yelling at her whenever she tried to bring up Grace. So they are quite neglectful towards each other's emotions at points for sure. And when Carlos was really feeling bad over accidentally killing Gabby's stepfather, Gabby was so dismissive, like, oh, just get over it, Carlos. Who cares? And again, not 
looking at it from his perspective. By the way though, to be fair, I don't know why Carlos had so much guilt over killing Gabby's stepfather. He was always saying how much he hated the guy, so he's done her a favor now by getting rid of the guy. I mean, I would have thrown a party, personally. <laughs> I would have been like, yay, let's get out the birthday cake. Like seriously, the dude was a piece of shit. And apparently he had a new stepdaughter who he was also abusing. So in my mind, the world's a better place without him. So I, I know it sounds harsh, but that's just how I feel. And in the past, Carlos was ready to beat up and throw guys through windows who were being rude to his wife or even glancing in her direction. So it's not like he's never done this before. He has. It's not like he's never been brutal before is my point. Carlos knows how to be brutal. The next character I want to talk about is... Brie, who is, as I said earlier, probably my favorite housewife. I just love her. I think she's a babe. You empathize with her and you do want her to win, but also she really pisses you off sometimes. By the end of the show, I really felt like she was starting to understand that her flaws are what makes her human and she can still be loved even if she's not perfect. She was also a really great friend to the other girls right from the beginning. I noticed sometimes in her romantic relationships and her family, she was really controlling and cold but when it came to her friends I think Brie had a much healthier dynamic with them and she was always very giving and season eight proved that more than anything when she was happy to take the fall for the death of Gabby's stepfather and she was so determined to protect Carlos and Gabby and just and also financially often if the girls were having money problems she was very giving in that sense. I liked her alcoholism storyline because they brought it up in earlier seasons that it was a problem for her but then they didn't just forget about it because they brought it up again in like season eight when she was feeling really low and started drinking again and she started drinking again when Orson went to prison around season five and I love how much she changed as well because in season one I couldn't stand her guts she was so rude and obnoxious and prim and proper and by the end she was like having one night stands and I just thought it was so cool like she really did so much her first husband Rex was part of what made me not like her in season one because he was truly the most bland and annoying male character ever and honestly so rude by the way she has a kid called Danielle who's up there for me with Tom and Catherine and John in terms of like the worst written characters because her daughter Danielle is genuinely so annoying I don't know what it is about her but every time she talks I'm like oh my god shut up and she has a son called Andrew who is probably one of my favorite characters in the show if not the best character because he starts off like unnecessarily horrible to Brie in season one and two. I don't know what justified him being that awful to her because he was horrible but part of it was because she wasn't accepting him being gay and so he was angry about it. Luckily he got over it and it was fine. He still had that kind of wicked streak to him because if Brie needed something stolen or something done she knew that Andrew would have a way of making it get done and she'd get him to like do the dirty work for her which I thought was so funny. So I really liked their interactions a lot but I was really sad that in season eight Andrew's character arc is seriously undermined by trying to invalidate the fact that he's gay and then he gets engaged to this girl and he's like mom I'm so happy like maybe you're right me being gay was a phase or whatever and Bree's like no it's not I can tell you're not going to be happy with this girl like why are you getting engaged to her and I thought yeah why is he getting engaged to her like why is he going through with something that is making him unhappy that he doesn't actually want to do I, I just didn't like that, especially because throughout the whole series, Andrew had always been so brave with expressing how he felt about his sexuality. But despite that, I loved him. I loved his interactions with Brie. And I loved how Brie had so many messy relationships. Like she had Rex, she had George, that creepy ass stalker pharmacist. She had Keith, this guy where there was an age gap relationship. She's done some shitty things. She was selfish, stealing Catherine's recipes and saying they were hers. So yeah, she's had her issues, but she also ends up in a lot of really funny situations as well like her fake pregnancy thing in season four was beyond funny and I also felt bad when she started her own business in season five and then had to undermine it for the sake of not upsetting her friends or something considering like her whole life she wasn't really taken seriously I think she deserved a bit of attention like earlier when she was telling Rex her first husband she wanted to do a cookbook he was so patronizing and saying you know that's sweet but you're never going anywhere with your life and so when she finally became successful I would have hoped that the girls would give her a bit more credit but Lynette especially was really rude about it and intimidated I guess because her own business wasn't going that well I also felt really bad for her in season eight Brie felt so bullied by Gabby in particular and the other girls and so Brie ended up getting depressed trying to kill herself and it reminded 
reminded me so much of Mary Alice, like the parallel, which was really sad, especially because Brie had been getting threatening messages saying, I know what you did, it makes me sick, which exactly mirrored the nasty messages that Mary Alice was being sent in season one before she died. So it felt like a repeat of history, except none of the girls were actually learning from it. And what made me so mad is that in like season three, Lynette had this beautiful dream where she visited Mary Alice and she was feeling so bad and guilty over not being able to save Mary Alice and not being there for her as a friend. Like, isn't there anything I can do? So I would have hoped that the girls would not want to repeat history and they would have been there for Brie. But if it wasn't for Renee, Brie would have killed herself. Mary Alice was so afraid of her friends turning on her once they learned of her secret, right? About her son not actually being her son, etc. And that's exactly what they did to Brie. They turned on her. For no good reason, by the way, as well. Like, Brie hadn't really done anything wrong. I will say, one failing in the writing when it came to Brie's character was the way her romances were handled, because even though I liked that she got out there and dated some guys, there were just a bit too many of them. It got quite confusing, and I don't think the show really had a clear direction of who she was going to end up with, because they really framed it like her and Orson were end game, but then they seemed to backtrack, and then she was spending so much time with Keith at one point that I thought, those two might end up together. She starts dating this lawyer and getting together with him in the finale. And although I liked him and everything, I really felt like he should have been introduced seasons earlier in the show. And I don't like the way they handled her husband, Orson, um, with his whole turning villain arc thing. I'm not gonna go into too many details because I went off about this in previous videos so much, but in summary, when Orson's introduced, he seems like a villain, and then we find out he was innocent the whole time and really loves Brie. And then they're a stable couple in like season four and season three, like he's just so loving towards her and genuinely just would do anything for her, and he's hilarious and cute. In season five, they start getting resentful towards each other. She finds out this big secret he has and it gets really messy and she never really forgives him. And then he starts getting super bitter towards her about her business and it was it made no sense. He was like jealous of her for her success and wanted her to give up her business, which made her so happy. And he was making these sexist comments and doing stuff that just did not feel like Orson at all. And to top it off, he started becoming this kleptomaniac, stealing stuff from people's houses and from his friends' houses and breaking into some old woman's house wearing a balaclava, which resulted in killing Edie because she swerved to avoid him when he was running across the road. And I was like, why wouldn't you feel bad? Your stealing led to Edie dying. Apparently it's because the actor always wanted to play a villain, so they gave him what he wanted, but it was just so dumb. And then he disappears for a while, and then she starts dating this other guy, Keith, and then Orson comes back into the picture in season seven, like, hi, Bree. Then he disappeared again. And I was like, okay, are we rid of him now? Because this guy's literally like a wart. He just keeps coming back. He's so annoying. And then in season eight, right, Brie starts getting these threatening notes about the fact that her and the girls had covered up the murder. It's not saying like, give me money. It's just threatening her and only her saying, I know what you did. It makes me sick. But they're not actually saying, I'm going to blackmail you. So it was really weird, especially because the other girls weren't getting the notes. And then we find out it was Orson doing that and threatening her like that, which is horrible. This policeman detective guy who was investigating them ends up being killed in a hit and run. And it turns out Orson had killed him to try and like protect Brie or something. And he was all like, I've done this for you. But he was saying it like a stalker. He was reminding me of George in season two, the pharmacist stalker. He was like, I'm obsessed with you. I've done this for you. And then he kept trying to isolate her from her friends when he came back in season eight, making up stuff, pretending they all hated her. I had to isolate you from those women because I knew if I didn't I would always be a distant second that's not good enough for me not this time which came out of nowhere because he was always happy for Brie to have her friends he always liked her having her friends and her social time why is he now trying to do this isolation abuse technique thing like it that's all I've got to say on that it was so dumb oh my god worst character ever Oh yeah, another character I mentioned who was assassinated is Catherine. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I talked about her so much in my other videos, but that whole arc with Catherine pissed me off so much and she's genuinely the worst written character ever. She appeared in the series fourth season premiere as the center of the mystery and she seemed like this very cold, honestly very bitchy personality. She wasn't very good at making friends. She wasn't very likable. And then it turns out that she wasn't as bad as we thought and it was a misunderstanding 
villain or something, which was a bit lame because I wanted her to be a villain. She only works as a villain in my mind. Then she comes in season five and she's all sweet and she's trying to like date Mike and she's being so cutesy about it and her abusive ex-husband had died. So I thought that maybe they were trying to show she was snapping, but they didn't do it very well because she never really brought him up again. So it was weird. And then Mike ends up dumping her and she has a full on mental breakdown and goes into stalker. I'm obsessed with Mike mode, which as if she would do that, she's a strong woman. There's no way. She'd be nice earlier because she sort of resolved it with Susan, that whole Mike love triangle thing. They resolved it. And then she came back in the finale and was making these passive aggressive comments to Lynette and being kind of bitchy again. And I was like, what? And then she suddenly says that she's gay and starts dating this woman and they move to Paris. But then in the finale, she comes back and says, oh, forget it. I didn't like women anyway. I just cannot keep up with her. She's so bad. Another character that I think really was done dirty is Edie. Now I like Edie way more than Catherine, but it's like they didn't know what to do with Edie and they kept like undermining her because Edie was introduced as this bombshell on the lane, the fun single one who's there mostly for comedic relief, not really to be a main character. Since the audience loved her so much, they incorporated her into the main cast. And although Edie was great in like season one, I just thought she was such a great character. She went through this really weird period where she was trying to get Carlos to love her and Mike to love her. And she went off the walls getting obsessed with these guys wanting her kind of in the same way that Catherine became obsessed with these guys but then in season five she comes back and she's happily married to this guy Dave or at least thinks she is and she seems really happy and she's like at her best in season five being super funny and sassy and great and then she ends up being killed off and I don't have an issue with her being killed off per se but you can definitely tell the show came from the early 2000s because the way they did it was super disrespectful and they were making out that She'd committed a lot of crimes in her life by being promiscuous or something. And the way she was killed off was very abrupt and kind of made into a joke, like it was funny. And then at her funeral, all the girls were making really disrespectful comments about like when she was a virgin and the men she slept with and her fake boobs and not even crying about it. And keep in mind, these girls had always isolated Edie. And if you rewatch season one, you realize how cold they were to her for no reason, especially when Edie came back in season five and seemed to have changed. She tried to seduce a lot of the girls, like ex-partners and stuff. In season five, she was happily married and she clearly wasn't gonna do that anymore, but they were still treating her like trash and ignoring her. And I felt like, okay, I understand if in the past you kept your distance, but now is the time to really include her because she's not doing that anymore and they still weren't. And it just made me sad. I feel like she was quite disrespected and then there was this episode after she died where they keep inserting these flashbacks to try and make out that all the girls were way more respectful and more friendly with her than they actually were, showing her having a heart-to-heart -heart bonding with Gabby about how she always felt like she was going to die young and going on jogs with Susan and giving Brie good advice and all these nice moments where she was extending generosity and friendship to the girls that was never there in the show previously. It was like an afterthought they added on and I just don't like that. I mean, they were never friends. Why are you trying to make out after the fact that they were good to her when they weren't and I just felt bad like Edie was such an icon and I think that she deserved better also I don't like it because after Edie's death in season five and around season seven they bring in this new character called Renee the one who slept with Tom and she moves in with Lynette and she's just a bit too similar to Edie more than I would like she's making comments about being a bad girl and <laughs> going to bars to find cute guys she was almost trying to be the new Edie but in a way that was a bit awkward and often I think it happened like twice where Renee took Brie to a bar and then took Lynette to a bar and the minute that Renee found a guy to talk to or something she'd stop being their wing woman and she'd just leave them there at the bar by themselves which just isn't being a very good friend so yeah those are my thoughts on the major women in the show and the main characters but the final topic I want to discuss because obviously this is a deep dive and I don't think I can do a video about this show without discussing this very important topic is a presentation of like body image and diet culture in this show. Nowadays, everyone's talking about Kardashian curves and stuff because apparently women's bodies are something that can go in and out of style, which is kind of gross when you think about it. But back then you wanted to look like Kate Moss and have a thigh gap and just be super thin or even underweight. And being seen as fat was undesirable and often actually comedic. And I remember Alicia Silverstone, who's absolutely wonderful and was in Clueless and is like a normal body type, was often made fun of for like being fat. And if you looked back on tabloid headlines, 
friends. It was always like, so-and-so looks fat, or hey, we found this pill to make you lose 10 pounds overnight. Marcia Cross, who plays Brie in Desperate Housewives, recently admitted that staying thin for the show and keeping those measurements was a living hell, and she felt like she'd been banned from eating ever since joining the show. Now, I did look it up, but I couldn't find anything, so I don't know if all the other women felt this way too, and they were like, oh my gosh, I felt like I couldn't eat what I wanted, or if it was just her that like, felt that pressure and struggled with that, I don't know. There was another girl that auditioned for the role of, was it Lynette or Brie? I don't know, but she didn't get the role because she was seen as like too curvy. So that's obviously an issue and it definitely comes through with the way that Gabby's daughters are treated. Despite those issues, I thought it would be fun over the week as I was doing this video and binge watching the show to maybe do some cooking because food is featured so much in this show. So I actually made a few of the women's recipes, which was really fun. And I'll link those recipes down in the description because if you want to have a Desperate Housewives themed party or something, this would be such a cute idea. And I veganized everything because I'm vegan, but I made a lot of stuff and it was so much fun. Like I made Lynette's coffee frappe and grilled cheese and Brie's blueberry crisp. By the way, Brie's blueberry crisp, I would definitely make again, especially as a uni student, because it's like a single serve dish. It's super easy and convenient. Like if you don't want a lot of cleaning up or anything and you just want it for one person. So that was so much fun. I loved making that. Oh, and the brownies as well, because I remember Lynette was given brownies in season four that had weed in them so that was cool because I know how vital food is to the show like it shows the housewife's personalities and reflects what's important to them like Brie really values food so it's definitely relevant to the show although funnily enough you don't see the women actually eating very often which was also an issue in Pretty Little Liars like it's seven seasons long and yet they're not eating the food <laughs> but yeah let me know what you guys think in the comments I loved filming this I'm covering Fate the Wink Saga season two next which I'm beyond excited for you guys have no idea so i love you make sure to give this video a thumbs up and i will see you guys for the next video Mwah.